Story two of A Changed Man and Other Tales by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Waiting Supper, Chapters five through eight. Chapter five a quarter of an hour brought her into the high street and for want of a more important errand she called at the harness-makers for a dog-collar that she required it happened to be market-day and nicholas having postponed the engagements which called him thither to keep the appointment with her in the sallows rushed off at the end of the afternoon to attend to them as well as he could arriving thus in a great hurry on account of the lateness of the hour he still retained the wild amphibious appearance which had marked him when he came up from the meadows to her side an exceptional condition of things which had scarcely ever before occurred when she crossed the pavement from the shop door the shopman bowing and escorting her to the carriage nicholas chanced to be standing at the road wagon office talking to the master of the wagons there were a good many people about and those near paused and looked at her transit in the full stroke of the level october sun which went under the brims of their hats and pierced through their buttonholes from the group she heard murmured the words mrs nicholas long the unexpected remark not without distinct satire in its tone took her so greatly by surprise that she was confounded nicholas was by this time nearer though coming against the sun he had not yet perceived her influenced by her father's lecture she felt angry with him for being there and causing this awkwardness her notice of him was therefore slight supercilious perhaps slurred over and her vexation at his presence showed distinctly in her face as she sat down in her seat instead of catching his waiting eye she positively turned her head away a moment after she was sorry she had treated him so but he was gone reaching home she found on her dressing-table a note from her father the statement was brief i have considered and am of the same opinion you must marry him he can leave home at once and travel as proposed i have written to him to this effect i don't want any victuals so don't wait dinner for me nicholas was the wrong kind of man to be blind to his christine's mortification though he did not know its entire cause he had lately foreseen something of this sort as possible it serves me right he thought as he trotted homeward it was absurd wicked of me to lead her on so the sacrifice would have been too great too cruel and yet though he thus took her part he flushed with indignation every time he said to himself she is ashamed of me on the ridge which overlooked froom everard he met a neighbour of his a stock-dealer in his gig and they drew rein and exchanged a few words a part of the dealer's conversation had much meaning for nicholas i've had occasion to call on squire everard the former said but he couldn't see me on account of being quite knocked up at some bad news he had heard nicholas rode on past froom everard to elsenford farm pondering he had new and startling matter for thought as soon as he got there the squire's note had arrived at first he could not credit its import then he saw further took in the tone of the letter saw the writer's contempt behind the words and understood that the letter was written as by a man hemmed into a corner christine was defiantly insultingly hurled at his head he was accepted because he was so despised and yet with what respect he had treated her and hers now he was reminded of what an agricultural friend had said years ago seeing the eyes of nicholas fixed on christine as on an angel when she passed better a little fire to warm me than a great one to burn ye. no good can come of throwing your heart there he went into the mead sat down and asked himself four questions one how could she live near her acquaintance as his wife even in his absence without suffering martyrdom from the stings of their contempt two would not this entail total estrangement between christine and her family also and her own consequent misery three must not such isolation extinguish her affection for him four 
supposing that her father rigged them out as colonists and sent them off to america was not the effect of such exile upon one of her gentle nurture likely to be as the last in short whatever they should embark in together would be cruelty to her and his death would be a relief it would indeed in one aspect be a relief to her now if she were so ashamed of him as she had appeared to be that day were he dead this little episode with him would fade away like a dream mr everard was a good-hearted man at bottom but to take his enraged offer seriously was impossible obviously it was hotly made in his first bitterness at what he had heard the least thing that he could do would be to go away and never trouble her more to travel and learn and come back in two years as mapped out in their first sanguine scheme required a staunch heart on her side if the necessary expenditure of time and money were to be afterwards justified and it were folly to calculate on that when he had seen to-day that her heart was failing her already to travel and disappear and not be heard of for many years would be a far more independent stroke and it would leave her entirely unfettered perhaps he might rival in this kind the accomplished mr bellston of whose journeyings he had heard so much he sat and sat and the fog rose out of the river enveloping him like a fleece first his feet and knees then his arms and body and finally submerging his head when he had come to a decision he went up again and into the homestead he would be independent if he died for it and he would free christine exile was the only course the first step was to inform his uncle of his determination two days later nicholas was on the same spot in the mead at almost the same hour of eve but there was no fog now a blusterous autumn wind had ousted the still golden days and misty nights and he was going full of purpose in the opposite direction when he had last entered the mead he was an inhabitant of the froom valley in forty-eight hours he had severed himself from that spot as completely as if he had never belonged to it all that appertained to him in the froom valley now was circumscribed by the portmanteau in his hand in making his preparations for departure he had unconsciously held a faint foolish hope that she would communicate with him and make up their estrangement in some soft womanly way but she had given no signal and it was too evident to him that her latest mood had grown to be her fixed one proving how well founded had been his impulse to set her free he entered the sallows found his way in the dark to the garden door of the house slipped under it a note to tell her of his departure and explaining its true reason to be a consciousness of her growing feeling that he was an encumbrance and a humiliation of the direction of his journey and of the date of his return he said nothing his course now took him into the high road which he pursued for some miles in a northeasterly direction still spinning the thread of sad inferences and asking himself why he should ever return at daybreak he stood on the hill above shottsford forum and awaited a coach which passed about this time along that highway towards melchester and london chapter six some fifteen years after the date of the foregoing incidents a man who had dwelt in far countries and viewed many cities arrived at roytown a roadside hamlet on the old western turnpike road not five miles from Froom everard and put up at the buck's head an isolated inn at that spot he was still barely of middle age but it could be seen that a haze of grey was settling upon the locks of his hair and that his face had lost colour and curve as if by exposure to bleaching climates and strange atmospheres or from ailments incidental thereto he seemed to observe little around him by reason of the intrusion of his musings upon the scene in truth nicholas long was just now the creature of old hopes and fears consequent upon his arrival this man who once had not cared if his name were blotted out from that district the evening light showed wistful lines which he could not smooth away by the worldling's gloss of nonchalance that he had learnt to fling over his face 
the buck's head was a somewhat unusual place for a man of this sort to choose as a house of sojourn in preference to some casterbridge inn four miles further on before he left home it had been a lively old tavern in which high flyers and heralds and tally hoes had changed horses on their stages up and down the country but now the house was rather cavernous and chilly the stable roofs were hollow-backed the landlord was asthmatic and the traffic gone he arrived in the afternoon and when he had sent back the fly and was having a nondescript meal he put a question to the waiting-maid with a mien of indifference squire everard of frum everard manor has been dead some years i believe she replied in the affirmative and are any of the family left there still oh no bless you sir they sold the place years ago squire everard's son did and went away i've never heard where they went to they came quite to nothing never heard anything of the uh, young lady the squire's daughter no you see twas before i came to these parts when the waitress left the room nicholas pushed aside his plate and gazed out of the window he was not going over into Froome valley altogether on christine's account but she had greatly animated his motive in coming that way anyway he would push on there now that he was so near and not ask questions here where he was liable to be wrongly informed the fundamental inquiry he had not ventured to make whether christine had married before the family went away he had abstained because of an absurd dread of extinguishing hopeful surmise that the everards had left their old home was bad enough intelligence for one day rising from the table he put on his hat and went out ascending towards the upland which divided this district from his native vale the first familiar feature that met his eye was a little spot on the distant sky a clump of trees standing on a barrow which surmounted a yet more remote upland a point where in his childhood he had believed people could stand and see america he reached the further verge of the plateau on which he had entered ah there was the valley a greenish-gray stretch of colour still looking placid and serene as though it had not much missed him if christine was no longer there why should he pause over it this evening his uncle and aunt were dead and to-morrow would be soon enough to inquire for remoter relatives thus disinclined to go further he turned to retrace his way to the inn in the backward path he now perceived the figure of a woman who had been walking at a distance behind him and as she drew nearer he began to be startled surely despite the variations introduced into that figure by changing years its ground lines were those of christine nicholas had been sentimental enough to write to christine immediately on landing at southampton a day or two before this addressing his letter at a venture to the old house and merely telling her that he planned to reach the roytown inn on the present afternoon the news of the scattering of the everards had dissipated his hope of hearing of her but here she was so they met there alone on the open down by a pond just as if the meeting had been carefully arranged she drew up her veil she was still beautiful though the years had touched her a little more matronly much more homely or was it only that he was much less homely now a man of the world the sense of homeliness being relative her face had grown to be preeminently of the sort that would be called interesting. Her habiliments were of a demure and sober cast, though she was one who had used to dress so airily and so gaily. Years had laid on a few shadows, too, in this. "'I received your letter,' she said, when the momentary embarrassment of their first approach had passed, and I thought I would walk across the hills to-day as it was fine i have just called at the inn and they told me you were out i was now on my way homeward he hardly listened to this though he intently gazed at her christine he said one word are you free i i am in a certain sense she replied colouring the announcement had a magical effect 
the intervening time between past and present closed up for him and moved by an impulse which he had combated for fifteen years he seized her two hands and drew her towards him she started back and became almost a mere acquaintance i have to tell you she gasps that i have been married nicholas's rose-coloured dream was immediately toned down to a greyish tinge i did not marry till many years after you had left she continued in the humble tones of one confessing to a crime oh nick she cried reproachfully how could you stay away so long whom did you marry mr bellston i ought to have expected it he was going to add and is he dead but he checked himself her dress unmistakably suggested widowhood and she had said she was free i must now hasten home said she i felt that considering my shortcomings at our parting so many years ago i owed you the initiative now there is some of your old generosity in that i'll walk with you if i may where are you living christine in the same house but not on the old conditions i have part of it on lease the farmer now tenanting the premises found the whole more than he wanted and the owner allowed me to keep what rooms i chose i am poor now you know nicholas and almost friendless my brother sold the froom everard estate when it came to him and the person who bought it turned our home into a farmhouse till my father's death my husband and i lived in the manor house with him so that i have never lived away from the spot she was poor that and the change of name sufficiently accounted for the inn-servant's ignorance of her continued existence within the walls of her old home it was growing dusk and he still walked with her a woman's head arose from the declivity before them and as she drew nearer christine asked him to go back this is the wife of the farmer who shares the house she said she is accustomed to come out and meet me whenever i walk far and am benighted I am obliged to walk everywhere now the farmer's wife seeing that christine was not alone paused in her advance and nicholas said dear christine if you are obliged to do these things i am not and what wealth i can command you may command likewise they say rolling stones gather no moss but they gather dross sometimes i was one of the pioneers to the gold fields you know and made a sufficient fortune there for my wants what is more i kept it when i had done this i was coming home but hearing of my uncle's death i changed my plan travelled speculated and increased my fortune now before we part you remember you stood with me at the altar once and therefore i speak with less preparation than i should otherwise use before we part then i ask shall another again intrude between us or shall we complete the union we began she trembled just as she had done at that very minute of standing with him at the church to which he had recalled her mind i will not enter into that now dear nicholas she replied there will be more to talk of and consider first more to explain which it would have spoiled this meeting to have entered into now yes yes but further than the brief answer i first gave nick don't press me to-night i still have the old affection for you or i should not have sought you let that suffice for the moment very well dear one and when shall i call to see you i will write and fix an hour i will tell you everything of my history then and thus they parted nicholas feeling that he had not come here fruitlessly when she and her companion were out of sight he retraced his steps to roytown where he made himself as comfortable as he could in the deserted old inn of his boyhood's days he missed her companionship this evening more than he had done at any time during the whole fifteen years and it was as though instead of separation there had been constant communion with her throughout that period the tones of her voice had stirred his heart in a nook which had lain stagnant ever since he last heard them they recalled the woman to whom he had once lifted his eyes as to a goddess her announcement that she had been another's came as a little shock to him and he did not now lift his eyes to her in precisely the same way as he had lifted them at first but he forgave her for marrying bellston 
what could he expect after fifteen years he slept at roytown that night and in the morning there was a short note from her repeating more emphatically her statement of the previous evening that she wished to inform him clearly of her circumstances and to calmly consider with him the position in which she was placed would he call upon her on sunday afternoon when she was sure to be alone nick she wrote on what a cosmopolite you are i expected to find my old yeoman still but i was quite awed in the presence of such a citizen of the world did i seem rusty and unpractised ah you seemed so once to me tender playful words the old christine was in them she said sunday afternoon and it was now only saturday morning he wished she had said to-day that short revival of her image had vitalized to sudden heat feelings that had almost been stilled whatever she might have to explain as to her position and it was awkwardly narrowed no doubt he would not give her up miss everard or mrs bellston what mattered it she was the same christine he did not go outside the inn all saturday he had no wish to see or do anything but to await the coming interview so he smoked and read the local newspaper of the previous week and stowed himself in the chimney corner in the evening he felt that he could remain indoors no longer and the moon being near the full he started from the inn on foot in the same direction as that of yesterday with the view of contemplating the old village and its precincts and hovering round her house under the cloak of night with a stout stick in his hand he climbed over the five miles of upland in a comparatively short space of time nicholas had seen many strange lands and trodden many strange ways since he last walked that path but as he trudged he seemed wonderfully like his old self and had not the slightest difficulty in finding the way in descending to the meads the streams perplexed him a little some of the old footbridges having been removed but he ultimately got across the larger watercourses and pushed on to the village avoiding her residence for the moment lest she should encounter him and think he had not respected the time of her appointment he found his way to the churchyard and first ascertained where lay the two relations he had left alive at his departure then he observed the gravestones of other inhabitants with whom he had been well acquainted till by degrees he seemed to be in the society of all the elder from everard population as he had known the place side by side as they had lived in his day here were they now they had moved house in mass but no tomb of mr bellston was visible though he had lived at the manor-house it would have been natural to find it here in truth nicholas was more anxious to discover that than anything being curious to know how long he had been dead seeing from the glimmer of a light in the church that somebody was there cleaning for sunday he entered and looked round upon the walls as well as he could but there was no monument to her husband though one had been erected to the squire nicholas addressed the young man who was sweeping i don't see any monument or tomb to the late mr bellston oh no sir you won't see that said the young man dryly why pray because he's not buried here he's not christian buried anywhere as far as we know in short perhaps he's not buried at all and between ourselves perhaps he's alive nicholas sank an inch shorter ah he answered then you don't know the peculiar circumstances sir i am a stranger here as to late years mr bellston was a traveller an explorer it was his calling you may have heard his name as such i remember nicholas recalled the fact that this very bent of mr bellston's was the incentive to his own roaming well when he married he came and lived here with his wife and his wife's father and said he would travel no more but after a time he got weary of biding quiet here and weary of her he was not a good husband to the young lady by any means and he betook himself again to his old trick of roving with her money away he went quite out of the realm of human foot into the bowels of asia and never was heard of more 
he was murdered it is said but nobody knows though as that was nine years ago he's dead enough in principle if not in corporation his widow lives quite humble for between her husband and her brother she's left in very lean pasturage nicholas went back to the buck's head without hovering round her dwelling this then was the explanation which she had wanted to make not dead but missing how could he have expected that the first fair promise of happiness held out to him would remain untarnished she had said that she was free and legally she was free no doubt moreover from her tone and manner he felt himself justified in concluding that she would be willing to run the risk of a union with him in the improbability of her husband's existence even if that husband lived his return was not a likely event to judge from his character a man who could spend her money on his own personal adventures would not be anxious to disturb her poverty after such a lapse of time well the prospect was not so unclouded as it had seemed but could he even now give up christine chapter seven two months more brought the year nearly to a close and found nicholas long tenant of a spacious house in the market town nearest to frome everard a man of means genial character and a bachelor he was an object of great interest to his neighbours and to his neighbours wives and daughters but he took little note of this and had made it his business to go twice a week no matter what the weather to the now farmhouse at frome everard a wing of which had been retained as the refuge of christine he always walked to give no trouble in putting up a horse to a housekeeper whose staff was limited the two had put their heads together on the situation had gone to a solicitor had balanced possibilities and had resolved to make the plunge of matrimony nothing venture nothing have christine had said with some of her old audacity with almost gratuitous honesty they had let their intentions be widely known christine it is true had rather shrunk from publicity at first but nicholas argued that their boldness in this respect would have good results with his friends he held that there was not the slightest probability of her being other than a widow and a challenge to the missing man now followed by no response would stultify any unpleasant remarks which might be thrown at her after their union to this end a paragraph was inserted in the wessex papers announcing that their marriage was proposed to be celebrated on such and such a day in december his periodic walks along the south side of the valley to visit her were among the happiest experiences of his life the yellow leaves falling around him in the foreground the well-watered meads on the left hand and the woman he loved awaiting him at the back of the scene promised a future of much serenity as far as human judgment could foresee on arriving he would sit with her in the parlour of the wing she retained her general sitting-room where the only relics of her early surroundings were an old clock from the other end of the house and her own piano before it was quite dark they would stand hand in hand looking out of the window across the flat turf to the dark clump of trees which hid further view from their eyes do you wish you were still mistress here dear he once said not at all said she cheerfully i have a good enough room and a good enough fire and a good enough friend besides my latter days as mistress of the house were not happy ones and they spoilt the place for me it was a punishment for my faithlessness nick you do forgive me really you do the twenty-third of december the eve of the wedding day had arrived at last in the train of such uneventful ones as these nicholas had arranged to visit her that day a little later than usual and see that everything was ready with her for the morrow's event and her removal to his house for he had begun to look after her domestic affairs and to lighten as much as possible the duties of her housekeeping he was to come to an early supper which she had arranged to take the place of a wedding breakfast next day the latter not being feasible in her present situation an hour or so after dark the wife of the farmer who lived in the other part of the house entered christine's parlour to lay the cloth what with getting the ham skinned and the black puddings totted up she said it will take me all my time before he's here if i begin this minute 
i'll lay the table myself said christine jumping up do you attend to the cooking thank you ma'am and perhaps tis no matter seeing that it is the last night you'll have to do such work i knew this sort of life wouldn't last long for ye being born to better things it has lasted rather long mrs wake and if he had not found me out it would have lasted all my days but he did find you out he did and i'll lay the cloth immediately mrs wake went back to the kitchen and christine began to bustle about she greatly enjoyed preparing this table for nicholas and herself with her own hands she took artistic pleasure in adjusting each article to its position as if half an inch error were a point of high importance finally she placed the two candles where they were to stand and sat down by the fire mrs wake re-entered and regarded the effect why not have another candle or two ma'am she said twould make it livelier say four oh, very well said christine and four candles were lighted really she added surveying them i have been now so long accustomed to little economies that they look quite extravagant ah you'll soon think nothing of forty in his grand new house shall i bring in supper directly he comes ma'am no not for half an hour and mrs wake you and betsy are busy in the kitchen i know so when he knocks don't disturb yourselves i can let him in she was again left alone and as it still wanted some time to nicholas's appointment she stood by the fire looking at herself in the glass over the mantel reflectively raising a lock of her hair just above her temple she uncovered a small scar that scar had a history the terrible temper of her late husband those sudden moods of irascibility which had made even his friendly excitements look like anger had once caused him to set that mark upon her with the bezel of a ring he wore he declared that the whole thing was an accident she was a woman and kept her own opinion christine then turned her back to the glass and scanned the table in the candles shining one at each corner like types of the four evangelists and thought they looked too assuming too confident she glanced up at the clock which stood also in the room there not being space enough for it in the passage it was nearly seven and she expected nicholas at half-past she liked the company of this venerable article in her lonely life its tickings and whizzings were a sort of conversation it now began to strike the hour at the end something grated slightly then without any warning the clock slowly inclined forward and fell at full length upon the floor the crash brought the farmer's wife rushing into the room christine had well nigh sprung out of her shoes mrs wake's inquiry what had happened was answered by the evidence of her own eyes how did it occur she said i cannot say it was not firmly fixed i suppose dear me how sorry i am my dear father's hall clock and now i suppose it is ruined assisted by mrs wake she lifted the clock every inch of glass was of course shattered but very little harm besides appeared to be done they propped it up temporarily though it would not go again christine had soon recovered her composure but she saw that mrs wake was gloomy what does it mean mrs wake she said is it ominous it is a sign of a violent death in the family don't talk of it i don't believe such things and don't mention it to mr long when he comes he's not in the family yet you know oh no it cannot refer to him said mrs wake musingly some remote cousin perhaps observed christine no less willing to humour her than to get rid of a shapeless dread which the incident had caused in her own mind and uh, supper is almost ready mrs wake in three-quarters of an hour mrs wake left the room and christine sat on though it still wanted fifteen minutes to the hour at which nicholas had promised to be there she began to grow impatient after the accustomed ticking the dead silence was oppressive but she had not to wait so long as she had expected steps were heard approaching the door and there was a knock christine was already there to open it the entrance had no lamp but it was not particularly dark out of doors she could see the outline of a man and cried cheerfully you are early it is very good of you 
i beg pardon it is not mr bellston himself only a messenger with his bag and greatcoat but he will soon be here the voice was not the voice of nicholas and the intelligence was strange i i don't understand mr bellston she faintly replied yes ma'am a gentleman a stranger to me gave me these things at casterbridge station to bring on here and told me to say that mr bellston had arrived there and is detained for half an hour but will be here in the course of the evening she sank into a chair the porter put a small battered portmanteau on the floor the coat on a chair and looking into the room at the spread table said if you are disappointed ma'am that your husband as i suppose he is is not come i can assure you he'll soon be here he stopped to get a shave to my thinking seeing he wanted it what he said was that i could tell you he had heard the news in ireland and would have come sooner his hand being forced but was hindered crossing by the weather having took passage in a sailing vessel what news he meant he didn't say ah yes she faltered it was plain that the man knew nothing of her intended remarriage mechanically rising and giving him a shilling she answered to his good night and he withdrew the beat of his footsteps lessening in the distance she was alone but in what a solitude christine stood in the middle of the hall just as the man had left her in the gloomy silence of the stopped clock within the adjoining room till she aroused herself and turning to the portmanteau and greatcoat brought them to the light of the candles and examined them the portmanteau bore painted upon it the initials j b in white letters the well-known initials of her husband she examined the greatcoat in the breast pocket was an empty spirit flask which she firmly fancied she recognized as the one she had filled many times for him when he was living at home with her she turned desultorily hither and thither until she heard another tread without and there came a second knocking at the door she did not respond to it and nicholas for it was he thinking that he was not heard by reason of a concentration on to-morrow's proceedings opened the door softly and came on to the door of her room which stood unclosed just as it had been left by the casterbridge porter nicholas uttered a blithe greeting cast his eye round the parlour which with its tall candles blazing fire snow-white cloth and prettily spread table formed a cheerful spectacle enough for a man who had been walking in the dark for an hour my bride almost at last he cried encircling her with his arms instead of responding her figure became limp frigid heavy her head fell back and he found that she had fainted it was natural he thought she had had many little worrying matters to attend to and but slight assistance he ought to have seen more effectually to her affairs the closeness of the event had overexcited her nicholas kissed her unconscious face more than once little thinking what news it was that had changed its aspect loath to call mrs wake he carried christine to a couch and laid her down this had the effect of reviving her nicholas bent and whispered in her ear lie quiet dearest no hurry and dream 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 of happy days it is only i you will soon be better he held her by the hand oh no 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 she said with a stare oh how can this be nicholas was alarmed and perplexed but the disclosure was not long delayed when she had sat up and by degrees made the stunning event known to him he stood as if transfixed ah is it so said he then becoming quite meek and why was he so cruel as to delay his return till now she dutifully recited the explanation her husband had given her through the messenger but her mechanical manner of telling it showed how much she doubted its truth it was too unlikely that his arrival at such a dramatic moment should not be a contrived surprise quite of a piece with his previous dealings towards her but perhaps it may be true and he may have become kind now not as he used to be she faltered yes perhaps nicholas he is an altered man we'll hope he is i suppose i ought not to have listened to my legal advisers and assumed his death so surely 
anyhow i am roughly received back into the right way nicholas burst out bitterly oh what two two honest fools we were to so court daylight upon our intention by putting that announcement in the papers why could we not have married privately and gone away so that he would never have known what had become of you even if he had returned christine he has done it to but i'll say no more of course we might fly now no no we might not said she hastily very well but this is hard to bear when i looked for good then evil came unto me and when i waited for light there came darkness so once said a sorely tried man in the land of oz and so say i now i wonder if he is almost here at this moment she told him she supposed bellston was approaching by the path across the fields having sent on his greatcoat which he would not want walking and is this meal laid for him or for me it was laid for you and it will be eaten by him yes christine are you sure that he is come or have you been sleeping over the fire and dreaming it she pointed anew to the portmanteau with the initials j b and to the coat beside it well good-bye good-bye curse that parson for not marrying us fifteen years ago it is unnecessary to dwell further upon that parting there are scenes wherein the words spoken do not even approximate to the level of the mental communion between the actors suffice it to say that part they did and quickly and nicholas more dead than alive went out of the house homewards why had he ever come back during his absence he had not cared for christine as he cared now if he had been younger he might have felt tempted to descend into the meads instead of keeping along their edge the froom was down there and he knew of quiet pools in that stream to which death would come easily but he was too old to put an end to himself for such a reason as love and another thought too kept him from seriously contemplating any desperate act his affection for her was strongly protective and in the event of her requiring a friend's support in future troubles there was none but himself left in the world to afford it so he walked on meanwhile christine had resigned herself to circumstances a resolve to continue worthy of her history and of her family lent her heroism and dignity she called mrs wake and explained to that worthy woman as much of what had occurred as she deemed necessary mrs wake was too amazed to reply she retreated slowly her lips parted till at the door she said with a dry mouth and the beautiful supper ma'am serve it when he comes when mr bellston uh, yes ma'am i will she still stood gazing as if she could hardly take in the order that will do mrs wake i am much obliged to you for all your kindness and christine was left alone again and then she wept she sat down and waited that awful silence of the stopped clock began anew but she did not mind it now she was listening for a footfall in a state of mental tensity which almost took away from her the power of motion it seemed to her that the natural interval for her husband's journey thither must have expired but she was not sure and waited on mrs wake again came in you have not rung for supper he is not yet come mrs wake if you want to go to bed bring in the supper and set it on the table it will be nearly as good cold leave the door unbarred mrs wake did as was suggested made up the fire and went away shortly afterwards christine heard her retire to her chamber but christine still sat on and still her husband postponed his entry she aroused herself once or twice to freshen the fire but was ignorant how the night was going her watch was upstairs and she did not make the effort to go up to consult it in her seat she continued and still the supper waited and still he did not come at length she was so nearly persuaded that the arrival of his things must have been a dream after all that she again went over to them felt them and examined them his they unquestionably were and their forwarding by the porter had been quite natural 
she sighed and sat down again presently she fell into a doze and when she again became conscious she found that the four candles had burnt into their sockets and gone out the fire still emitted a feeble shine christine did not take the trouble to get more candles but stirred the fire and sat on after a long period she heard a creaking of the chamber floor and stairs at the other end of the house and knew that the farmer's family were getting up by and by mrs wake entered the room candle in hand bouncing open the door in her morning manner obviously without any expectation of finding a person there lord a mercy what sitting here again ma'am yes i am sitting here still you've been there ever since last night yes then he's not come well he won't come at this time of morning said the farmer's wife do he get on to bed ma'am you must be shrammed to death it occurred to christine now that possibly her husband had thought better of obtruding himself upon her company within an hour of revealing his existence to her and had decided to pay a more formal visit next day she therefore adopted mrs wake's suggestion and retired chapter eight nicholas had gone straight home neither speaking to nor seeing a soul from that hour a change seemed to come over him he had ever possessed a full share of self-consciousness he had been readily piqued had shown an unusual dread of being personally obtrusive but now his sense of self as an individual provoking opinion appeared to leave him when therefore after a day or two of seclusion he came forth again and the few acquaintances he had formed in the town condoled with him on what had happened and pitied his haggard looks he did not shrink from their regard as he would have done formerly but took their sympathy as it would have been accepted by a child it reached his ears that bellston had not appeared on the evening of his arrival at any hotel in the town or neighbourhood or entered his wife's house at all that's a part of his cruelty thought nicholas and when two or three days had passed and still no account came to him of bellston having joined her he ventured to set out for froom everard christine was so shaken that she was obliged to receive him as she lay on a sofa beside the square table which was to have borne their evening feast she fixed her eyes wistfully upon him and smiled a sad smile he has not come said nicholas under his breath he has not then nicholas sat beside her and they talked on general topics merely like saddened old friends but they could not keep away the subject of bellston their voices dropping as it forced its way in christine no less than nicholas knowing her husband's character inferred that having stopped her game as he would have phrased it he was taking things leisurely and finding nothing very attractive in her limited mode of living was meaning to return to her only when he had nothing better to do the bolt which laid low their hopes had struck so recently that they could hardly look each other in the face when speaking that day but when a week or two had passed, and all the horizon still remained as vacant of Belston as before, Nicholas and she could talk of the event with calm wonderment. Why had he come to go again like this? And then there set in a period of resigned surmise, during which so like, so very like was day to day, that to tell of one of them is to tell of all nicholas would arrive between three and four in the afternoon a faint trepidation influencing his walk as he neared her door he would knock she would always reply in person having watched for him from the window then he would whisper he has not come he has not she would say nicholas would enter then and she being ready bonneted they would walk into the sallows together as far as to the spot which they had frequently made their place of appointment in their youthful days a plank bridge which bellston had caused to be thrown over the stream during his residence with her in the manor-house was now again removed and all was just the same as in nicholas's time when he had been accustomed to wade across on the edge of the cascade and come up to her like a merman from the deep here on the felled trunk which still lay rotting in its old place they would now sit 
gazing at the descending sheet of water with its never-ending sarcastic hiss at their baffled attempts to make themselves one flesh returning to the house they would sit down together to tea after which and the confidential chat that accompanied it he walked home by the declining light this proceeding became as periodic as an astronomical recurrence twice a week he came all through that winter all through the spring following through the summer through the autumn the next winter the next year and the next till an appreciable span of human life had passed by bellston still tarried years and years nick walked that way at this interval of three days from his house in the neighbouring town and in every instance the aforesaid order of things was customary and still on his arrival the form of words went on he has not come he has not so they grew older the dim shape of that third one stood continually between them they could not displace it neither on the other hand could it effectually part them they were in close communion yet not indissolubly united lovers yet never growing cured of love by the time that the fifth year of nick's visiting had arrived on about the five hundredth occasion of his presence at her tea-table he noticed that the bleaching process which had begun upon his own locks was also spreading to hers he told her so and they laughed yet she was in good health a condition of suspense which would have half killed a man had been endured by her without complaint and even with composure one day when these years of abeyance had numbered seven they had strolled as usual as far as the waterfall whose faint roar formed a sort of calling voice sufficient in the circumstances to direct their listlessness pausing there he looked up at her face and said why should we not try again christine we are legally at liberty to do so now nothing venture nothing have but she would not perhaps a little primness of idea was by this time ousting the native daring of christine what he has done once he can do twice she said he is not dead and if we were to marry he would say we had forced his hand as he said before and duly reappear some years after when christine was about fifty and nicholas fifty-three a new trouble of a minor kind arrived he found an inconvenience in traversing the distance between their two houses particularly in damp weather the years he had spent in trying climates abroad having sown the seeds of rheumatism which made a journey undesirable on inclement days even in a carriage he told her of this new difficulty as he did of everything if you could live nearer suggested she unluckily there was no house near but nicholas though not a millionaire was a man of means he obtained a small piece of ground on lease at the nearest spot to her home that it could be so obtained which was on the opposite brink of the froom this river forming the boundary of the froom everard manor and here he built a cottage large enough for his wants this took time and when he got into it he found its situation a great comfort to him he was not more than five hundred yards from her now and gained a new pleasure in feeling that all sounds which greeted his ears in the day or in the night also fell upon hers the caw of a particular rook the voice of a neighbouring nightingale the whistle of a local breeze or the purl of the fall in the meadows whose rush was a material rendering of time's ceaseless scour over themselves wearing them away without uniting them christine's missing husband was taking shape as a myth among the surrounding residents but he was still believed in as corporeally eminent by christine herself and also in a milder degree by nicholas for a curious unconsciousness of the long lapse of time since his revelation of himself seemed to affect the pair there had been no passing events to serve as chronological milestones and the evening on which she had kept supper waiting for him still loomed out with startling nearness in their retrospects in the seventeenth pensive year of this their parallel march towards the common bourne a labourer came in a hurry one day to nicholas's house and brought strange tidings 
the present owner of Froom Everard, a non-resident, had been improving his property in sundry ways, and one of these was by dredging the stream which in the course of years had become choked with mud and weeds in its passage through the sallows. The process necessitated a reconstruction of the waterfall. When the river had been pumped dry for this purpose, the skeleton of a man had been found jammed among the piles supporting the edge of the fall every particle of his flesh and clothing had been eaten by fishes or abraded to nothing by the water but the relics of a gold watch remained and on the inside of the case was engraved the name of the maker of her husband's watch which she well remembered nicholas deeply agitated hastened down to the place and examined the remains attentively afterwards going across to christine and breaking the discovery to her she would not come to view the skeleton which lay extended on the grass not a finger or toe-bone missing so neatly had the aquatic operators done their work conjecture was directed to the question how bellston had got there and conjecture alone could give an explanation it was supposed that on his way to call upon her he had taken a short cut through the grounds with which he was naturally very familiar and coming to the fall under the trees had expected to find there the plank which during his occupancy of the premises with christine and her father he had placed there for crossing into the meads on the other side instead of wading across as nicholas had done before discovering its removal he had probably overbalanced himself and was thus precipitated into the cascade the piles beneath the descending current wedging him between them like the prongs of a pitchfork and effectually preventing the rising of his body over which the weeds grew such was the reasonable supposition concerning the discovery but proof was never forthcoming to think said nicholas when the remains had been decently interred and he was again sitting with christine though not beside the waterfall to think how we visited him how we sat over him hours and hours gazing at him bewailing our fate when all the time he was ironically hissing at us from the spot in an unknown tongue that we could marry if we chose she echoed the sentiment with a sigh i have strange fancies she said i suppose it must have been my husband who came back and not some other man nicholas felt that there was little doubt besides the skeleton he said yes if it could not have been another person's oh but no of course it was he you might have married me on the day we had fixed and there would have been no impediment you would now have been seventeen years my wife and we might have had tall sons and daughters it might have been so she murmured well is it still better late than never the question was one which had become complicated by the increasing years of each their wills were somewhat enfeebled now their hearts sickened of tender enterprise by hope too long deferred having postponed the consideration of their course till a year after the interment of bellston each seemed less disposed than formerly to take it up again is it worth while after so many years she said to him we are fairly happy as we are perhaps happier than we should be in any other relation seeing what old people we have grown the weight is gone from our lives the shadow no longer divides us then let us be joyful together as we are dearest nick in the days of our vanity and with mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come he fell in with these views of hers to some extent but occasionally he ventured to urge her to reconsider the case though he spoke not with the fervour of his earlier years autumn eighteen eighty seven end of story two Chapters 5 through 8